I was flying down I-5, heading north, around, getting close to Everett. <laughs> to you that live around there, all of a sudden, traffic just stopped. And I mean, so I hit it. Wet pavement, too. Hit the brakes, and I'm sliding. Ooh, I'm not going to make it. Okay? I am going to rear end a car. I, I can already tell. And then suddenly, at the last second, it's like the Holy Spirit says, turn right. And I went like this into the next lane. I saw in my mirror, nobody was there. Did a little whip around, and, and that minivan stopped perfect right behind the person in the next lane, uh, right beside the person I would have hit. You know, so God even talks to us like that. But most of the time, it's through the word. And, you know, we like to say, uh, we like to sing songs. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves the little children. We tend to forget, especially in the society we live in, we struggle with the father role. And, and that's mainly because in so many times in our lives, the father role has been broken. Okay? So we don't know a father like we should. I'm, I'm, there's not too many children anymore growing up who have a father perspective like God would want them to be a father. And that's sad. Because a father should be uh, somebody who loves their kids and is there for them. Not somebody who just works. Uh, so what you provide for your kids, they want more than that. They, they want more than just you give them things. That, you know, a lot of times fathers, we, we, we get this idea that that's showing love. We, but kids want you. Just like we want more from our, our Heavenly Father, we would want Him to be a part of our lives, not just somebody who sets up there and rules on us. So the, the way we begin to see God, the Father, is He is the just one, not Jesus. He's the loving one. And that's not right according to Scripture. Okay? Jesus is loving, but guess who we learned it from? The Father. So, you got your Bibles? We're going to go on a little scripture tour of that fact, okay? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Now, John is called John the Beloved. <laughs> we, have a, we have a John that wants... See, we, we have all these Johns in our church. There's Big John. Big John is so named Big John because Big John is 6'7", six, 6'8", six, somewhere in there. And I don't know how much he weighs, but it's a lot, okay? So Big John fits him. Then we have Little John. Little John, though, is still 6'2". Okay? And then we had Middle John, who sings in the worship team, who's still a big guy. But when he stands beside Big John, he doesn't look so big. No, because Big John is a big guy. So, and then we get, we, we get two more Johns. We get a young John. So, young John, that's what we call him, young John. Young John helps with sound sometimes. If I say that just right, that almost sounds oriental. Anyway, young John. Anyway, but it's not. It's young John. And it's just because he's the youngest of all the Johns I've mentioned so far. And then... Uh, John the Beloved chose his name mainly because of this guy. John the Beloved. John the Beloved was, uh, well, when he talks about himself, he never mentions his names. He just says the disciple that Jesus loved. That's a pretty good way to put yourself, I guess. Don't, don't you think? I'm the, dis I'm the one that Jesus loved. It's almost like he didn't really like the others, but he liked me. I don't know. As a kid, that was my perspective. The first time I read it, I'm like, well, that's a little stuffy. But as I read it a little more, I realized that that's not what he was trying to get across. But when I was a young man reading it, that's the first perspective I've got. John really liked his, uh, himself. Anyway, not true. Because here's where he describes what the love of God is. First John chapter 3, starting with verse 1, he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, 
and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who, has, who, who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So everyone who has this hope that someday I'm going to see the Father. Now the Bible says that no man has seen the Father at any time. So that means nobody living has ever seen the Father. Anybody who says a little different is, doesn't agree with that. Because the Bible's pretty clear that no man can even look upon the Father. Um, the Father, the reason being is the Father's holy. How many of you feel like you're a holy, holy person? And I'm, I'm not talking about with, that, with, with, with God on your side. Of course that happens, but on my own, are you a holy person? No. The Bible says we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. I mean, it's pretty, pretty clear that without God and without his forgiveness, we are not holy. God is. God the Father is holiness in the only way you could describe it. Okay, so to look upon God in our flesh, which is broken, is more than our flesh can handle. Okay, so, so we can't look at God the Father. But someday I'm going to see him face to face. In fact, every human being will see him face to face. But it says here that, that God loved us so much that he... He desires to call us his kids. Adopt us. You ever, have you ever watched adoption? I think adoption's cool. I do. Because it reminds me of the biblical perspective. How God takes in kids that are not his into his own. And they become his. Okay? So when, when, I, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I gave my heart to him, then I became his kid. And he adopted me, which is pretty cool because that means adoption is, they want you. Now, see, my parents just got stuck with me. They didn't see it that way, okay? I was trying to ex describe, because uh, it's funny to, to describe to to young married couples what it's going to be like to have a baby when they haven't had one yet. And they feel like, what's it going to be like to have a stranger in our house? I said, they're never a stranger. And they, said, they have a hard time understanding that, but it's true, isn't it? When you, had a, when you had your first child, it's not like they were strange to you. It's just like, they belong. It's like, they've always, it's, in fact, it's almost like they've always been a part of your life. It's, it's kind of strange how that happens, but it's true. But adoption is, I choose you. I want you to be my child. So G God the Father literally takes us as his children. When we accept Jesus, the sacrifice that Jesus did for us, when we accept the sacrifice and say, Lord, we want you to be Lord of our lives, we accept what Jesus has done for us then we become adopted into the family of God. We become his children. So what John the Beloved is saying is, is uh, it, it's a blessing to be called a child of God, and so we are. And then he says this, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The world ha struggles with God. Isn't it strange that they can almost accept every other religion but Christianity? You ever watch the news? How they, they and, and even the media, okay, you start watching television shows. I want you to notice how the Muslim is starting to look really good on TV. They either have the terrorists who are not true Muslims. That's what they always want to emphasize. They're not true Muslims. And then there's the, the, the majority of Muslims, which are really good, which might be true. I don't know. But they, but they, they, they make this like, they, but Christianity, we always look like bums to the media. We're judgmental and harsh. and You know, I don't know too many Christians who are judgmental and harsh. I know a lot of Christians who are loving and kind and giving. 
and thoughtful. The main reason they struggle with Christianity is because it's the real deal. The rest are just religions. It's easy to accept th- something that's not even real. Oh, come on. You, how many of you like ghost shows? Oh, one hand. You, yeah, see, there are some of you that do and some of you that didn't raise your hand because I don't want to be known that I like ghost shows. You know, okay. No, I've never gotten into ghost shows, to be honest, because, well, it's just like when, when, when kids try to scare me because there's always some little kid who wants to jump out and boop you know, scare me, and I'm just not a jumpy guy, so I usually don't jump, you know, and and my, usually my answer, listen, if you've really seen the devil, boo, does not scare you, okay, okay, because I've really seen the dark side, I don't want to see it, it's not enjoyable, and it is a little scary, even though I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, there's part of my humanness that does not enjoy it, does not want to welcome it. When I hear people bragging, well, I'm covered by the blood. I love getting in demon battles. I, I, my first thought is, you haven't been in many, have you? Because I have. They're not fun. It is a, it's, it's, it's a battle just like the Bible describes it. It's not this fun thing. But, you know, uh, we just get a little weird about stuff sometimes because we're human. But see, God loves us even though we're, we're all different. And a real father loves unconditionally. I'm serious. I heard a story of a kid who who just got his driver's license. And he borrowed dad and mom's car to go be with some friends. First night driving by himself. And, And he swerved to miss a dog and hit a tree. Had to call his dad on the phone. He got his mom, which he was thankful for at the time because he was thinking, man, dad's going to kill me. You know, first time I take the car out and I hit a tree. You know, so he, his mom goes, uh, well, let me put your dad on. And he's like, no, 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 don't put dad on. You know, and, and uh, puts the father on and the father goes, I'll be right there. And the father shows up. And the son's waiting to get blasted. It never happens because the father says, well, he starts laughing. And he goes, well, better the car than you. And the son learned something, that he was more important than stuff. See, God loves us unconditionally. I don't have to, I don't earn his love. You you don't earn him to love you. You know, Christians are always trying to, well, if I do this, and and if I do this, then then God will really, no, 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 no. God already loves you. So much so that he would send his own son to die on a cross for you. That's that's some pretty good love, okay? I don't think he needs to prove it anymore. I think what we need to do is accept it. God loves you. Not because you've earned it. And so with any, John the Beloved goes on. So what does that mean we're going to look like someday? You know, because everybody asks, I get this question a lot. What are we going to look like in heaven? I don't know. I've never been there. You know, that's the best description right there. And I don't know what we'll look like. But someday when we see him face to face, we're going to be like him. That's a pretty cool thought. Because, you know, my whole life's goal has been to be like my father and not my earthly father. Because when, when I do things like my earthly father, like I just caught myself d- doing something just there when I said that, he always had his hands in his pockets like this when he'd preach, always. I mean, it was constant. And he'd jiggle his keys. I, I don't do that very often. I try to keep my hands up here because... Jiggling your keys is not right. That's in my brain because my dad used to do it all the time. I'd sit there in the row and hear his keys going chicken, 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 while he's preaching. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> in my brain, just stop. You know, but, but he never would. We'd even talk to him as kids. Dad, why do you do that? Put your hands in your pockets and jingle. I don't know, I just do it. 
but it didn't change anything. He did it his whole life. He had both hands would go in there and you'd hear him playing with his keys while he's preaching and I'm like, so I, and I'd, of course, then I'd be funny. Dad, what was the key to your sermon? <laughs> and of course, my dad didn't find the humor in that at all, but, you know. <laughs> Dad's, what I learned from my dad though, patience. And I hear too many Christians tell me, don't pray for patience. Can I disagree? Pray for patience. Because I think a good father and a good mother has patience. A good son who reflects his father should have patience. Amen? amen. That was a quiet amen. Some of you are going, yeah, I don't know. Man, that's a tough one to learn, patience. You know, we live in America. It's fast. We don't have to go in and pay for our gas anymore. We could do it at the pump. And when it's not fast, we're like, you crazy machine. Bam, what's wrong with you? You know, come on. You've seen people doing that, haven't you? Or come on, work. Hitting the machine. I haven't seen anybody hit the ATM machine. You know, maybe they were hoping for the bells to ring if they hit it. Ching, 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 and the money comes out. I don't know. But uh, I've never had that happen with an ATM machine. It usually does exactly what I tell it unless it says this machine is not working at this time. Which then I don't put my card in. I, hopefully you don't either. You know, but, but we live in this world that wants everything now. And God wants us to learn to be like him now. Not later, now. So that someday when I'm in heaven, I'm a lot like my father. In fact, he wants me literally to reflect him. Because that's what true sons and daughters do, is they reflect their parents. And that's why some of us have bad attributes that we don't like. <laughs> you know? Have you, have you ever caught yourself doing something your parents used to do? Come on, be honest. How many of you have ever, raise your hand, you, you caught yourself doing something that your parents used to do and you're like, oh, stop! I have. There's part of me, I just hate that. You know, because especially the irritating things. You know, I've never had glasses, so I've never had, and I've shared that one. My dad used to do that all the time too, once he got glasses. I counted one Sunday how many times he did that. I think it was like in the 30s. I missed the whole sermon. All I remember is how many times he touched his glasses. That's, th that's just not right. Sometimes we as people, though, we get irritated by something that the speaker does, and we're like concentrating on that. So like people say to me all the time, you talk with your hands. My hands have never said a word. <laughs> they might move while I talk, but they don't talk, okay? <laughs> But my hands do move. I can't help it. I'm, uh, my, my problem, and most of you know this, is I grew up before ADD was there, but I pretty much had ADD. I could not sit still. I was a curse to my mother most of the time in church because she was always grabbing my leg. Still. Stop it. Shh. It, was, it was just this constant. You know, and I had to sit by her till I was a teenager. I mean, I could not go sit by my friends because if I did, they started talking. You know, because I'd start visiting with them. And pretty soon we we're all talking. And that's when your father, who was the preacher, would call you out from the front. Because I wasn't sitting with mom, who would make me be quiet. Then he'd say stuff like, Vern, go sit with your mother. <laughs> when you're in high school, that's kind of embarrassing. Okay? And at the time, I'm like totally embarrassed. My parents hate me. Come on, how many of you have ever thought those thoughts? Because your parents uh, justly punished you? Because I've been, most all, I think all my punishment I deserved. Have you ever been punished and you felt like you didn't deserve it? Every time. It's just about every time. Every time my parents punished me, it's like, and, and you know, of course I gotta bring up the famous saying, this hurts me more than it does you. I hated it. 
absolutely hated when they'd say that because I'm like, liar. <laughs> My rear tells me different. You know, so we have all these experiences with parents that we've experienced and it changes us as a parent, seriously. When I became a parent, I determined I will never say to my kids, this hurts me more than it does you. Because my whole life, I hated that one. That one or someday you will thank me for this. You ever say that to your kids? Or How many have ever said that to your kids? I want you to know they don't understand it. Makes no sense. Although now I look back, I get it. I do. And, and now it makes sense, but at the time, <laughs> to say that, it was like a waste of breath because it went right over my head. It's just like, someday I'll thank you. I will never thank you for this. As, I mean, seriously, that's what you're thinking as a kid because you hurt when you're in pain. And sometimes when our fathers punish us, have you ever been punished by God? Do you think God's a mean father? If he was a mean father, you'd be in hell already. Because that's what you deserve. True? That's what the Bible says. There is none righteous, no, not one. So that means I deserve hell. Because I've sinned. I've lied. I've cheated. I've taken stuff that I wasn't supposed to. So that means steal. I think the worst thing I've ever stole, though, is a cookie. So I'm not like this really bad thief, but I wasn't supposed to take one, so that's still stealing, isn't it? I mean, I mean, God wants us to be perfect imitations of him. So let's read about it more, a little bit more about what he's like. If you want to turn in your Bibles. John. John the Beloved wrote this one too, but St. John. Chapter 1. In John chapter 1, verse 12, he writes, But to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It was the Father who sent his only Son, as John 3.16 says. It says it in John 3.16. I already finished reading, so don't be looking for what I'm reading. Okay. It was John 3.16 that it says it was the Father who chose us. For God so loved you that he gave his only son. So God chose you. you. You thought you chose him maybe all this time. You became a Christian because, well, you know, I, I heard that I, I, you know, there's this God that loves me and you didn't realize he was chasing you. Did you know that? Do you know that God loves you so much he pursues you? He pursues you your whole life. If you don't give yourself to the Lord, he pursues you your whole life. Because he wants none to perish, the Bible says, but all to come to repentance. That's a pretty powerful statement. God doesn't want anyone in hell. He would, he would love to see hell empty. So when people say, oh, well, if God really loved people, then he wouldn't send people to hell. No, that would, that would mean that God is one thing he is also described as is just. And part of love is justice. Come on. It, when I, when I, I'm loved by my parents, and I wasn't the one who did something wrong, but my brothers were, I don't deserve the punishment they do. That would be justice. Justice, when it's done right, means I'm not punished for somebody else's mistake. So if I'm truly loved, then there's got to be justice. If there is love, there's justice. There is. They go hand in hand. And so what you want is love without a piece of love. True love is just. And so God is exactly who he says he is. If God says there's a hell, which he does, and that he wants no one there, which he says, then we're the ones who make the choice. In fact, that's what real love is. It's love returned. 
God wants me to love him back. He doesn't want to force my love. That's not love. I mean, that's, that's easy for us to say. You know, why didn't God just make us all serve him? Because then we'd all go to heaven. Well, then we wouldn't love him. We'd just be robots without a free will. God wants us to be able to choose him. Just like he chose us. So, what is it that causes us? Because if God knows we're sinners... God knows we're broken. What would, what would get us to know what kind of father he is? Because see, there's a lot of people who believe in God who don't know the father. I'm serious. See, when I talk about God, he's, my, he's more than just a father. He's my friend. He's somebody who talks to me even in my darkest moments. When I'm alone, I'm never alone because he's there. When I'm hurting, I'm not hurting alone. He's always there. He never leaves me, never forsakes me. He is always with me. It's not just Jesus. It's the Father. The Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, envelops us. And so he shares this in Romans chapter 8. Paul writes this, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, which literally means Father, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's how I know I'm his, not because I did the things that I'm supposed to do. When I accept Jesus, his Holy Spirit, you know, I've had people describe it, and I would describe it as this. When I accepted Jesus, it almost felt like I'd been washed inside. And I've heard other people tell me the same thing. It's almost like I got cleaned on the inside out. I mean, just literally like, wow, I feel good. I've had, I don't know how many people have told me that when they've accepted Jesus. Man, I, I just feel, I just feel really good. And that's the Holy Spirit confirming with your spirit that you, you have accepted him as your savior. And then he goes on and he says this, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then he says in verse 17, and if children, then heirs. What does it mean to be an heir? How many, how many of you today will, honestly would like to be an heir of Bill Gates? <laughs> That'd be kind of nice, you know? Bill's my buddy. He's going to leave me a couple mil when he dies, you know? Except for one problem. I might be older than him or close to the same age. So I probably am not going to get anything. That's what an heir is. So literally, he's saying, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, which means he's like my brother, Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Ooh, don't like the last statement. Because it says provided, I'm an heir of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided, which means if I suffer. I suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What does it mean to suffer with him? Do you think Jesus had fun when he was on earth? Yeah. Oh, come on. Sitting around the fire with the disciples? You have to admit, they had some jokes coming. Probably somebody told, mocked one of the other disciples, like Peter did it again. <laughs> he, he says the stupidest things. And of course, everybody would start ribbing Peter like, oh, you mouthed off again and got stuck with it. Or who knows what they would joke about around the fire. I'm, I'm sure that they had fun. Jesus was not just the son of God when he walked this earth. He was flesh. And I think uh, if there's one thing Jesus had was a big smile. 
I think he smiled a lot. And I think there were times he'd laugh around the fire with the disciples when they'd do something stupid or say something dumb and he'd just laugh. Because he gets that. He made us to laugh. True? I mean, he gave you laughter. You like to laugh? Come on, it does feel good, don't you, when you laugh? You'd probably rather do that than cry. I mean, just watch a Hallmark movie and you'll get the crying part, okay? No, I'm just kidding, don't, don't watch a Hallmark movie. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, a merry heart does good. God wants us to, well, what does it mean to suffer though? Because there was a time when Jesus had to suffer. And I'm not just talking about the cross. Imagine what it was like to walk with a man named Judas for three and a half years and the whole time you knew he was going to turn on you. Imagine what that was like. That he wasn't who he said he was the whole time. Even though he said he cared about you, he was going to turn on you in a heartbeat for money. And you knew it. You knew it. What does it mean to suffer, provided we suffer? Because being a Christian is not easy. The easy road is to fit in and just do what the world wants. To be politically correct in everything you say and do. Don't try to say, no, that's not true. Because if you start really standing up for Jesus, you don't fit in anymore. It's true. It's why high school was really hard for me, not because of any other reason but being a Christian. I was mocked for being a Christian. I was teased for being a Christian. But I stood up. Why? Because I felt like God called me to stand up. I felt like God wanted me to be different. I felt like God had called me not as a preacher, because I'd already told the Lord that was something I was never going to do. Music, he's going to do music, but, and I do that for the Lord. Suffering, if you're really going to follow Jesus, you don't fit into this world anymore. It becomes an un- uncomfortable place. You should notice that in the workplace, because their language doesn't fit your language. Their world does not fit your world. Oh man, when I'd go to, I went to my 10th year reunion, I just determined right then and there I'd probably not go to another one. They had it at the Eagles, okay? It, it, they, they have it at the Eagles so they can have a bar. And you know, partway through the reunion, some of the guys, most of the people are starting to get a little toasted. You know, they'd come and talk to you and all you smelled was whoo. <laughs> You know, you need a breath mint. Because <laughs> uh, alcohol, it just permeated the place. Because the world sees that the only way you can have fun is get tipped. Let me tell you something. I have fun every day knowing that someday I'm going to see my Lord face to face. I have joy that I'm forgiven. That I have grace and mercy. And I have joy that my family is following Jesus. And that they love him. And that they're going to be with me someday. He's a good father because he is the perfect example of what love is. And I want to love like him. I want to love unconditionally. I hate it when Christians don't love unconditionally. I watch Christian parents disown their children. Horrifies me. Had, them in my, had kids in my youth group that their parents just disowned because they did something their Christian parents disagreed with. Well, I'm sorry. I have done things that my father disagrees with over and over and over again, yet he says, I love you, Vern. And not, not, there isn't one of you here that God hasn't allowed back in. There isn't one of you here that God hasn't said, I love you. No matter what you've done, I love you. I care about you. So me suffering means I don't fit into this world anymore. I've chosen to be like him. He's different. 
He's not like the world. They love when it feels okay for me. When it's convenient. Love God's way is unconditional. That means even if they hurt me, I'm gonna love them. So like those men on the beach, they got their heads sawn off off by ISIS. They were all singing a praise song to the Lord. All, All of them as they're lined up. As their heads were sawn off, they were singing to the Lord how they love Jesus. And what they were literally saying is, we don't hate you. Love you. Because God loves you. See, if we suffer, you're gonna, if you truly stand up for God, this world is not gonna feel home anymore. And that's the truth. It starts to feel like, I don't belong here. I feel that every day. And you just thought, well, Vern, that's normal because you're weird. (laughs) Of course you don't fit. You shouldn't feel at home here. Serious. There's things I like about this world. Oh, come on. When I fish, I love fishing. But God created that. I love hunting. God created that. I love sports. I didn't like the Huskies losing yesterday, but it was a good game. Yeah. But I don't put sports in front of Jesus. Jesus is more important than sports. I get bothered when people put things in the wrong place. Suffering for, suffering for Jesus does not me- mean missing a football game. Okay? I'm just clarifying that. It doesn't mean you missed shopping today. It, suffering for Jesus means being made fun of at your place of work. Maybe even losing your job because you took a stand. You wouldn't lie. You wouldn't cheat. You were honest. Suffering for Jesus means some friends won't hang out with you because you won't laugh at the stuff they tell. You won't, you won't go that way. You don't fit in anymore. See, if I'm going if if to really know who my good, good father is, then it means it's, gonna be a, it's not always going to be easy for me. See, and every one of you have to make a choice. Every one of us. Do I want to know the Father or just know about Him? See, when I get to know Him, it means His Holy Spirit begins to talk to me. And all of a sudden, He becomes real. See, I know God, not as a God up there, I know him. Even though I've never seen him, I know him. He talks to me all day long. And it's awesome. I can sit down and he'll talk to me. I can be driving the car and he'll talk to me. It was, it was instantaneous when I talked to my dog and caught myself when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and gave me this message. He's a great father who loves his children and wants us to know him the way he knows us. Amen? Let's all bow our heads.